All right, why don't we get started and we'll let people join us. Okay, so um, I'll just wave, I'll say hi to everybody and um, welcome everybody here to our speaker series. We're, we're still remote and someday we're gonna be back in person, but I um, thank, thank everybody for joining us. I know it's um, everyone's very busy these days, but um, tonight we have something very special. It's a pleasure to introduce um, Lindsay Juris Rosner, who's gonna have a conversation with me or I'm gonna have a conversation with her and I'll tell you a little bit about Lindsay and let her then tell you what she does. Uh, Lindsay was, she looks like a true New Yorker. She was at Columbia University, BA in economics, went to Harvard Business School, uh, then started with a smaller company, Spot Runner, and then was at Microsoft for a number of years and Simul Media. And for the past seven years or so, almost eight years now, uh, she's been the CEO and founder of a company called Wealthy. And I have to, if you don't see that how you spell wealthy, it's wealthy as in healthy. Okay, so it's not on the financial side of wealthy. And um, it's an amazing company in what they're doing, but and that's what we're gonna speak about. So uh, let me, Lindsay, let me welcome you. And perhaps why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? That always seems like a great start. Sure, happy to. Well, thank you so much, Elliot. And it's such a pleasure to be here. And um, just enormous respect for, for the work that you all do. You know, we focus at Wealthy on helping families that are dealing with complex, chronic, and ongoing care needs. Unlike you all, we don't actually focus on the medical side of care. We don't focus on the clinical um, portions of care. We focus on the non-clinical aspects of care. So helping families navigate finding the right in-home aid or handling a move into a long-term care facility, finding providers, scheduling appointments, dealing with insurance, um, navigating to the right insurance option. And so uh, really we're focused on family caregivers, really supporting family caregivers and creating a better caregiving experience. Um, and so the mission of the business is very personal to me. Elliot, you were kind to um, just mention my professional background. What you didn't mention, which is really the relevant experience to my founding of Wealthy is that I was a caregiver for my mom for 28 years. My mom got diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis, MS, um, when I was nine years old. And I was involved in her care uh, for three decades up until she passed away about four years ago. And it was just absolutely the most challenging, stressful, loneliest thing I've experienced in my life and started to lift my head up and realize that other people were dealing with very similar versions of my story. And I just became obsessed with creating a better healthcare experience for families like mine and, and families like many of yours. So, I, you know, it's interesting. I think um, obviously your company started well before COVID, but the things you read about these days about COVID and uh, probably the biggest headline sharing the financial papers, uh, but it all is um, hiring. Places like Hopkins were short. I think the Dean mentioned that we're looking at almost 5,000 people were short. You, you read about Amazon. So you're looking at all companies here and there. You go to, when you go down a the street, there's not a store that's not trying to hire people. Um, now, there are many reasons why that's happening, but one of the reasons I think, particularly in the COVID era, was the fact, and they speak about this, so many women have left the workforce. Yeah. And how does that how does that play into what you're doing? And how do you know how, how you know what's the challenge? Because as people are become caregivers, whether it's for children or adults or parents, it's the problems involved with doing that and navigating that. So exactly our our focus at wealthy we so we actually sell into our, our business model is we sell into and partner with employers and companies provide wealthy as an employee benefit and so we work you know our clients include accenture fidelity facebook google merck medtronic oracle delta best buy i mean you know sort of a who's who's who list of clients and the reason they're offering wealthy it's not just because it's a nice thing to do and it makes their employees feel good. It's very much because people can't come to work, you know, if you're juggling care at home and this is still, you know, still a women's issue for the most part, we're seeing that change a bit with millennials, 
but it's still more so a women's issue that women are involved in caring for family members. And what we're seeing is women getting squeezed, you know, with kids in the home, parents that they're involved in caring for, potentially in-laws, other relatives, and care was complicated before COVID, to your point. What happened with COVID is that care became even more complicated. The considerations, you know, just multiplied because when you're thinking about who to bring into the home or maybe moving your, your, you know, aging parent into a more supportive living environment, you, you know, families are now grappling with like, is this safe? You know, what, is it safe to bring an in-home aid in to take care of mom? It potentially didn't feel safe for a long time. And so families were taking on that that care themselves. And then we saw that with childcare, you know, children doing the remote learning. And we saw the burden really fall kind of more heavily on women. And so women were stepping out of the workforce. And so we see companies implementing wealthy to support all employees, but especially those mid to senior level women who are in the sandwich generation, who have kids in the house and other family members who they're taking care of. And it's just Im- impossible. It's impossible to work a full-time job, be focused and productive all day and juggle the phone calls and the last minute things that crop, crop, you know, crop up or, or stepping in to actually bathe and dress and handle uh, the, the kind of caretaking for, for older adults. And so it's a massive issue. So we, just so uh, certain terms always are interesting. Sandwich generation, what is that? So a sandwich generation refers to um, individuals who are caring for both um, children and parents. I'll mention there's also a term called a club sandwich generation. So there are people who are taking care of multiple generations, kids, parents, and even grandparents. I'm a, I'm a, I was until a couple months ago, my grandfather passed away, but I was involved in my grandfather's care, my mother's mother-in-law's care. And then we have four kids. So, you know, it is, you know, multi-generational. So into, you know, you mentioned, and um, so let, let me ask, I'll ask two questions, but I'll ask the first one first. What, so how, what, what do you, what do you do? So let's say, okay, so you mentioned that some companies have it as a benefit. So the benefit would be is kind of like almost anything you get, right? Like health insurance or education benefit. Is that what you mean by benefit? Exactly. So it's it's completely free for the employee and the employer covers the cost for the employee. And it's really seen as a win-win. You know, employees get time savings, cost savings, um, and support for these critical needs. Employers see their employees, you know, be more productive, need to take less, you know, time off or, or not need to take a leave of absence and then not need to quit their job or resign from their job because of caregiving needs. Um, so we're sort of operating for families like a care concierge. Essentially what we've built, which your audience will appreciate, essentially what we've built is a scaled platform for social work. You know, we have a team of social workers that are partnering with families to manage, navigate, and find the right resources, services, and programs and providers and set things up for the families. So it's almost like in, in, you know, in the medical world, how the medical world now thinks of telehealth, we're sort of telecare or telesocial work. So, so let, let, let's go through just a simple, so let's say someone, you know, at a company, Accenture, has a problem with their mother-in-law or mother or child. They would call up a number, and then what happens? So they actually would come to wealthy.com, share a little bit of information about what their situation is. And that's very critical for our model, because what we're doing with that information is matching that family up with the best fit care coordinator for them. So that's typically a clinical social worker, so an, um, an individual who has some area of expertise or background that's relevant to what that family is dealing with or experiencing. And so we match that family up with that dedicated care coordinator. And some families choose to just message with their care coordinator. You know, I'm really busy. I'm in the middle of my work day. I need to figure out X, Y, or Z. Can you help? Others want to get on a call and do a kickoff call, invite other family members And our care coordinators will get to know families' goals and situation and needs, 
and then go about getting things done. So actually finding that in-home aid, actually vetting different options for um, an assisted living home, uh, whatever it is that the family is needing or, or, or feeling like their, their next step is for their care. And are you, do you do this in all 50 states? It's not just something you're doing in New York City or where you're based. Yeah, so we, so we support families across the 50 states in Puerto Rico, and then we launched outside of the U.S. a couple months ago. And so we're now supporting families in Canada and the U.K. And, you know, nobody on this call will be surprised. You know, the caregiving crisis that we're experiencing in the United States is a global crisis. You know, we have a large aging population. Thanks to brilliant researchers and scientists, we have incredible, you know, medications and drugs and treatments that allow people to live longer than they ever could before. The problem is people are living longer with really complicated care needs. Um, you know, we see older adults with multiple chronic conditions, seeing multiple specialists on multiple medications, needing in-home support, um, and that's great to extend life, uh, but it does require, you know, more involvement of the family to, to take care in a way that I don't think historically uh, was ever the case. It's interesting. That, how do you do it? I mean, I don't want, you know, this, the, the formula to Coca-Cola, but you know, it's one, so if I call you up and you know, my wife was having, her, her father was, was ill. So they're in Asheville, North Carolina, something like that. Yeah. So how do you know, you know, I, I can understand you could speak to one of your people and listen to the problem, understand the problem, but how do you get drilled down to be able to find somebody in Asheville? How do you do that? Well, you know, it's interesting, Elliot, like, you know, people come to us all the time and say, my gosh, wealthy helps. We, we help a, across six pillars of care. So financial, legal, in-home housing, medical and social emotional, always on the administrative and logistical details. We're not prescribing or treating or diagnosing. Um, and everybody comes to me and says, but my situation is so complex and so unique. And I get that it feels that way for families when they're going through these situations. For us, they're fairly consistent. We see with a high degree of um, you know, repetition and, and consistency, the same issues over and over. Now there are definitely some nuances. You know, families are very particular. Maybe it's their cultural background or religious background that there are nuances to the needs. Um, you know, socioeconomic status plays in a big way. You know, how how, how can the family afford to pay for care work or if they can't? What are different programs to leverage? Those things come into play. But we know across the country and now in Canada and the UK, what are the support mechanisms? What are the types of programs that are often available? And so we know where to look, even if it's in Asheville, North Carolina, it doesn't matter. We know that there's likely this, this, and this. And if those aren't available because each local market might be a little different, we know to look into this, this, and this. Um, and so it's really pretty consistent for us. We've also used technology to build you know, the sort of central knowledge base so that as we discover resources, programs, uh, different, you know, um, you know, different cool uh, offerings that we think, you know, our families can benefit from, we're leveraging those across other families. Um, and so it really does bring some scale. My vision is to organize and, you know, create just, you know, this central place for families to be able to go to where, you know, based on your need, based on your situation, your condition, um, and your location, we can tell you in real time, you know, what's available and the right fit for you. We're not there yet. We still rely really heavily on um, our human talent to navigate for families, but we do see a vision where that becomes, you know, an organized platform experience uh, for, for those that choose to kind of self-serve. It doesn't exist today, you know. And how many people do you have working for you now, you know, throughout the, the system? So we have about 300 people on our team. Um, we're scaling so fast. We hired 71 people um, just last quarter. You know, we, we were not a cool, nobody cared. We were not cool for a very long time. Um, and, and then we started to become cool um, and people started to care. And then the pandemic happened and our business has just exploded. You know, this, it, it strikes a nerve. You know, now it's almost every single family who feels like they 
can relate in some some way. And how do you so a question would be is and this is with any company, whatever you're doing, how do you know you're doing a good job? How do you measure? So two questions. One, how do you know you're doing a good job? And how do you measure success? When you, and, and especially also when you're talking to your, you know, the people who work for you, I hate to call them employees, but people who are part of your company, how do you, uh, how do you lead the charge? How do you do that? I, I, I think every day is, is learning and growing to the best of my abilities. But I think for us, and I know everybody, you, you can relate certainly, Elliot, but, you know, we have the unbelievable fortune of getting to change people's lives. People come to us, families come to us in crisis, in a reactive state after a fall, a hospitalization, a new diagnosis. And they come to us and they say, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know where to start but I have a big job, I have kids, I have this, I have that, like, just help me figure it out, help me handle it. And we get to step in and, and be that hero and, and really help families through these very challenging times. I know, I know, you know, you and your colleagues do the exact same thing, uh, but we hear it, you know, so we ask people, we, we measure success with the customer satisfaction survey, we use net promoter score, and we send that out to families and ask for them to score us. How likely are you to recommend wealthy to friend or neighbor or colleague? And they score us, you know, zero to 10. And then we ask them for feedback. Tell if you want to share more about your experience. And in the early days of wealthy, you know, gosh, I just set out to help make things a little easier for families. You know, I continue to be blown away and humbled and just it, the feedback we get on a daily basis, you know, we hear it. Families, families will write me directly and say, Lindsay, I don't know where I would be today without wealthy. And you, you all helped us. You helped my mom get set up and I got to go back to work and I'm so appreciative for your support. Um, and so we hear it from families and we see it in the net promoter score. And so what we started to do, Elliot, is we feed that feedback directly in real time into our internal, we use Slack for internal communications. And so every single wealthy team member sees in real time customer feedback and gets to experience, you know, whether they're an engineer or a care coordinator, they get to feel like they're having an impact, which they are, you know, on, on everyday people's lives in a very meaningful way. And that is beyond gratifying. And I know you can relate, but, you know, as we grow the team and look to attract and retain talent, you know, being this mission-driven company, this mission-driven startup with this very focused mission, we attract caregivers. I mean, I, it's some crazy number of our team of employees who come to Wealthy because they have a child who has autism. They have a parent they're taking care of who has dementia. It's personal. It's palpable. They, they want to solve the problem for their own family. So if, if someone engages with one of your care, one of your people, how long is the average, you know, so you have the first call, you're trying to find out the problem. How long is that engagement? Do you have some idea about, and I know you probably have an idea of every single step of the process, but how long does the people stay involved with you? It's interesting. So we see an average care project, as we call it, is three to four months in length that a family is working with us. Some are much shorter if it's more straightforward, you know, there's certainly some care projects that are a month in length. We have some families who have been with us for years, just ongoing, you know, especially for more complicated care needs. But on average, it's that three to four months. What's interesting, though, is about 25% of families we work with return to us within a one year period. Um, and we see this in care, right? You know, there's a, you know, conditions progress, you know, mobility declines or cognitive abilities change. Um, I tell people it's like playing that game whack-a-mole where things just continue to kind of pop up for families. And so we do see people return to wealthy and say, hey, you, you helped me earlier with this and now we're experiencing this and could really use some help with this, this, and this. And we step in and, and can you know, restart that care project and, and get going right away. So if um, you, know, you mentioned it's often a benefit, but if someone doesn't have that benefit, how do they, do they just go to the website yeah, we actually, so we started Wealthy direct to consumer and private pay family first, uh, really because we were obsessed with creating that, you know, ideal experience for families, first and foremost, regardless of 
longer term payers. Um, so we still offer direct to consumer. You can come to Wealthy. We charge $350 per month. Our rates are going to go up. So if you are interested in working with us, come over now. Uh, we don't do anything to market. I think this is the first time we've actually marketed right here, right now. This is not marketing. This is education. This is not marketing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we don't do anything to promote our direct to consumer business, um, mostly because, you know, in the early days of wealthy, even at our price point, and we tried to be as cost effective as possible, um, but to deliver the quality of the experience we deliver, we couldn't go any lower than that. And, you know, for Americans right now, that's prohibitively expensive for, for most Americans. And so families were hearing about us and so hopeful and coming to us and saying, I need Wealthy's help, but I can't afford uh, to pay your cost. And so we started helping people for free and, you know, and that's not a business model, just in case anybody was wondering. So uh, we, we pivoted to working with employers, which is, a, which is our main revenue channel. We're also, by the way, starting to work with payers, health plans. Um, and so we have a couple of commercial plans that are rolling us out to their, um, to their members and clients, and then um, in talks with, an, with a Medicare Advantage plan or two, which I think is very cool. Right. You know, it's interesting, though, I, I, I never like to give suggestions to people who are running companies because uh, like what our next speaker is from um, you know, sell scrubs, right? Figs. Mm. And I said, you know, when she told me five, six years ago, she was starting this and I said, well, you know, to make hospital gowns. You know, people hate hospital gowns. Make good quality hospital gowns. She didn't listen to me, which is why Figs is worth like 6.5 billion now. So, uh, so don't, don't listen to what I have to say. But my question is, it would seem, um, do you deal with hospitals? Because it would really seem like as patients are getting discharged, all of a sudden someone had unexpected surgery. They're now being discharged to home you give them some quick instructions, you put them in a car and they're on their own. I mean, that would seem to be an ideal thing for a hospital to offer. I love that idea too. Um, we've explored this concept only a little bit, but I love the idea. Uh, I agree with you. And I think, you know, people, families walk out of Hopkins every day with a newly new disability, um, or new kind of impaired, you know, functionality of some sort. And it's like an entire change of existence for that family. And I think hospitals do incredible work, but that discharge, it's just, there's not enough time. And then there's not usually typically much follow-up. Um, and I think that's a huge opportunity for wealthy to support families through the discharge process, but also, you know, in the value-based care model, to support in preventing readmissions and, you know, adhering to care plans and all the stuff we we like to talk about. So I love it. Um, if anybody has anybody for us to hire to help run the hospital side of our business, um, please contact me. So keep in mind. So let me let me just say one thing to the audience. So I don't. I I want you guys to ask questions too. So you. Can, you can put it in the chat room, but then I'll just call on you because it's much easier because I and most of you know that I don't like to read the, uh, the chat things out loud. So if you have a question you would like to ask, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. So um, so as you look at the company now, so I guess one thing would be is someone would say, well, you know, and I said this to you, too, when I heard the name wealthy, it sounds like wealthy. You know, and then you mentioned to me. I, if you came up with a better name, you would change it. But, and I know, uh, I think um, I did hear you speak that you, you had this wealthy thing 20 years or so before you had the company, right? We, so it's funny. I started the company. I started working. We technically incorporated Wealthy on December 31st, 2014. So we weren't quite a business. We started helping families in late 2015 um, and then really got going with employers in 2016, 2017. Um, but I bought the domain name wealthy.com in 2009. I was obsessed. I was obsessed with building this business. But the weird thing, Elliot, and I, you know, I'll, I'll admit this here because not to overly generalize, but I do think, I do think that women leaders experience this more than male leaders, which is I felt like I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to be an entrepreneur. I wasn't ready to be a startup CEO. I wasn't ready to lead people and employ people. I didn't know I needed to kind of go through a process. So I did. I took five years. 
I worked for this serial successful entrepreneur. I was his apprentice almost. I was running marketing and running his executive team. And I felt like I needed to prepare. And, you know, I started to watch him over the years. And I thought to myself, I think I can do what he's doing. And then eventually I was like, I could definitely do what he's doing. And I could probably do it better than he's doing it. And that's when I felt like I was ready. But it's funny because I do think that women often feel that way, that they're not ready for that big career advancement. Um, and it's a shame because I think I was ready. I think I could have done a great job, um, you know, in retrospect, but, you know, I felt for whatever reason, like I needed to do my homework and, and prepare and see what it looked like. Um, so yeah, I, I bought the domain name and sat on it, got a lot of offers by the way that I passed up. Um, but yeah, eventually, uh, you know, took full advantage of wealthy.com. Let me, let me just follow up on that because I've, I've heard, you know, the comments you made about the women entrepreneurs. I know, uh, um, you know, Jenny speaks about that all the time. And uh, what, do you, what do you think that is? I mean, I, I know raising money is not difficult for any, for, it's difficult for everyone to raise money. Right. Unless you're Elon Musk, let's say, perhaps. True. But what is it? I mean, did, you know, do you have a, you know, in growing up or now even, do you have a role model? Is there someone you look at and say, I want to be like, uh, I want to be like that, or is it just the process? There weren't, there aren't many role models. Um, there really aren't many women role models um, that I could look up to or that I had access to. I think there's a gap. I mean, listen, 2% of venture capital last year went to female founders, 2%. It's like shocking. Um, and I think that's going to change. I think that's changing in a big way. I think the reason why it's like that today is that there are more male investors um, who are running the big venture funds. And by the way, that's changed a lot in just the last two years. But traditionally, it's it's the venture community was all male, and you know most venture investors, you know, have a have a little bit of risk aversion to them. They're looking, they're doing pattern recognition, right? Understandably, uh, they want to be very, you know mindful of where they put their money. And so I think there, there, you know, there's this subconscious bias that now I think people are recognizing more, but a subconscious bias where investors, you know, if I'm a male, you know, um, engineer from MIT and I meet a male engineer from MIT, you know, that person, you know, they look familiar. I can relate to them. I understand where they're coming from, you know? And so that's, to me, that was the problem. There weren't enough Jennies, um, deploying capital. And so women founders weren't, were getting passed over by male investors. Um, I think that's changing, you know, it's changing and, and the trend is, is going in the positive direction. I think 2021 numbers are going to look really different, but I don't think it's going to be 50, 50. Um, and women start different businesses. Women start, you know, people start companies for problems that they get obsessed with. And so women see, different problems than men sometimes. And so sometimes those businesses, you look at wealthy, I mean, wealthy is, you know, the majority of caregivers are women. We're solving a problem for women. It's a personal issue I've dealt with. And so sometimes I would pitch male investors and they say to me, hmm, yeah, I think we're dealing with this, but it's more so my wife, right? Like they couldn't personally relate to the problem. And so that was sometimes our issue in pitching investors. And, but so it's interesting. It always interests me because I've asked this question to a, a number of very, very successful women who their role model is. And the answer you gave is the typical answer we get, um, which is kind of, you know, it's there are a number of women who I know who have been very successful in business or, you know, you think about many of them. But it's interesting that, um, that that's a challenge. I think, you know, I, I mean, that, you know, that just the fact that you don't have someone to look up to. So, so I know you know Jenny Abramson, uh, and that's you know I, I, Jenny is uh, was one of our speakers a number of years ago. Jenny runs this big um, fund out of Washington, so uh, and so, uh, so Jenny knows this better than anybody. And I remember her saying that you know women, her mother was a venture capitalist, and the percent of money in venture capital when her mother did it forty years ago and now hasn't changed by even a percentage point. Mm. But but how, how, so how do you do it? So how do you know? If you don't have a role model, you have this idea and this vision, how do you go about making that happen? That's, oh, it always interests me because many people sit around saying, I have this really good idea 
And you know, is that that old was it? I forgot who had that poetry. Whereas, if you want your ship to move, you got to put the sails out. Don't stay in the harbor. You know, what made you finally do it? Wait, Ali, and I want to ask who was your, who was your mentor? I can't. Oh well, no, I I had a few people. I mean, I um, I I got lucky in um, at Hopkins. There was someone named someone named John Cameron, who was chairman of surgery, who was just had this vision of how he did things, and I always was in awe of him. And then I had the, the fortune of uh, meeting people at Pixar and Steve Jobs that way. And so I got to know those people and it was people who had these visions that were far above anything I could ever do, but at least you could sort of see things through their eyes that, you know, this idea of not settling or, you know, taking risks, I think uh, that's, an, that's important. I, I think it's just the idea of people, you know, if you can look at someone and say, you know, I want to be like them, or at least something like that, oh, it kind of works well. It does work well. I love that. Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, I'll go back to your question. Will you? Uh, I got distracted. Will you ask? So your question for me is kind of how I pulled together the early. Right, because you, know, right, you, know, you, you basically start when you start a company, you're starting from nothing. It's not like you took over someone's company and then you built it and you, you know, it did much better under your reign. I mean, you were starting from a stop. You yeah. had an idea. You had something you were building on based on your own family situation. But, you know, but taking it from there is not that easy, obviously. It's not. And it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg because, you know, to find co-founders and early team members, they want to feel like there's some capital and there's a path to find capital you know, they need to feel like there's a starting team, you know, so it, it, it is this like, you know, the sequencing timing, you kind of have to get it all right. Um, you know, for me, I got some early kind of consultant type people involved. And I, I maybe early on said that they were, you know, I made it seem like they were more fully involved than maybe they were, you know, you do a little bit of the dance. So I had these consultants who were helping. And then I found my dream co-founder, our CTO. And with that, and I put together a pitch deck and I was so passionate and I went out to all the wealthy people I know, not wealthy as in W-E-L-L to dry as we spell it, actually rich people and, you know, asked for money, but my gosh, was that hard to ask for money, to, to ask them to invest. They weren't investing. There was no business. They were investing in me. Can you believe, like, I need you to believe and if you will, write a check for 25 grand or 50 grand, but like, oh my gosh, it was painful and it felt so uncomfortable. And so getting comfortable with the ask and then people would say, oh, I'm in Lindsay, you got me, let's talk. And then I'd have to chase them down for a check. And I was like, hey, remember how you said you wanted to invest? Well, well do you still wanna invest? I want, you know, it's awkward. I'm not, you know, it, it was, it's always kind of hard. and. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that initial capital from, and it was really people call, you know, former colleagues, um, mentors, various folks I had known over the years and had worked with or, or for um, people in my personal life, friends um, who believed in me and believed in the vision and saw the problem and wanted to support. And, you know, it'll be really exciting. I, you will have some early investors, you know, who put in $10,000 who will someday make millions. And, you know, I couldn't be, it'll be, you know, the happiest moment uh, to be able to see that happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting that early capital, those early investors, getting those early team members, it's just, you know, piece by piece, putting it together, you know. Um, and then we start to reach, you know, things start to gel and things start to click. You know, for us, it took a, a couple years really for us to start really, you know, knowing our model to get a couple of those big early employer clients were huge for us. And then you're sort of off to the races. You know, it's funny, raising capital as a female founder matters less if you can get past the early stages because then it's just about the metrics. You know, it's less about the person and the vision and the story and investors saying, do I believe that this person can build this business? They don't have to believe anything once you reach a certain stage. 
um, and you have revenue and you have clients and you have, you know, proof points, um, it becomes more about the metrics. So things in some ways have almost gotten easier for us from an, you know, from a fundraise perspective. So in terms of the business trying to build it, what do you think are your biggest challenges right now? Hiring the right people probably is one, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. What's your big, what's your biggest, what are the, what are the things that keep you up at night? I mean, the company's going along well, I know, I, I kind of know about how much funding you got. I read in the paper as well, but what keeps you up at night? What are your worries? It's scaling. It's how we scale really beautifully. You know, we have to scale to maintain quality, um, but to do so increasingly efficiently, leverage the data we're capturing, leverage uh, technology and and our platform to get better and better at, at the way that we service families. You know, we're supporting a million covered lives today. Um, I want that to be 10 million over the next couple of years and getting from 1 million to 10 million will mean hiring the right people, um, investing significantly in, in our platform to enable that skill. And then, um, you know, just pushing ourselves to continue to do better and do more. You know, we have really big clients who believe in us. We're the first mover. We have this kind of first mover advantage in our in our specific lane. We now have all these competitors coming into our space, these younger companies. And so I just want to make sure we maintain that market leading position, that first mover advantage. I want when companies think of supporting their, their caregiving talent, I want Wealthy to be the premier company they, that they go to. Okay. So let me ask, I'm going to allow, hey, Norm, I'm going to call on you, okay? I'm going to allow you to talk. Norm, how's it going there? Good. Hey, Thank you. Thank you for the uh, joy of being able to talk, sir. I really appreciate it. Um, and really, uh, well, first, uh, MSU is third in the CFP poll for the end of year championship. So that's okay. good. And then I, I need to get to the championship. I'll know who to go to. Okay. I'll set you up, my friend. Okay. I just want to say bravo on, you know, first uh, on taking care of, of your mom with MS. That's really inspirational. Um, and, you know, in healthcare, patient experience, cost reduction, and improving health is what we call the triple aim. There's a fourth, which is improving the work life of healthcare clinicians and staff. And too often we pay lip service to that, but we don't invest. And if we look over 40% of young physicians with full-time faculty appointments at academic medical schools leave in the first 10 years. And I think your observation about the responsibility of, of taking care of family members, because about one in five in medicine are involved in elder care, um, and it particularly affects women has really resulted in what we see in some of the disparities in women junior faculty advancing. And I guess the, the question would be, you, I see such a need for your work in higher education. The Doris Duke Foundation is partnering with 10 medical schools to look at early career scientists who have extra professional caregiving demands. And so I don't know if you're working with Doris Duke to show some of these outcomes that might help some of the medical schools see what is apparent to many, but the kind of the impact this could have on recruitment, retention, promotion, burnout. I don't know if you're working with any of those groups, but would be interested. And then if you're not, there's, I can know of at least one medical school that would help you do the analysis for free and mm -hmm. make the case because I think it's so important the work you're doing. Oh, I'd love that. I'd love that. No, I've never heard of Dur Doris Duke. So that's an organization I'll look up. Um, but Norm, thank you for your comment. We see the same thing. You know, we've started to bring on as clients hospitals, um, as you you all know better, but not only, you know, is there an issue with physicians, but nor nurses, you know, yeah. massive nurse shortage. And so hospitals are starting to come to us to support their nurses. You know, the problem, I talk about the sandwich generation. We, we refer to the sandwich generation as people taking care of kids and parents, you know, in a hospital setting, you know, in a healthcare setting, they're sandwiched in a different way. They're sandwiched between patients and then family care. They can't escape being a caregiving. And that is the recipe for burnout, right? When you can't 
yeah. take breath when you can't, you know, sit down or, or, or and, and just the nonstop, you know, demands and, and grief and all the emotional labor that goes into it. And so we're really seeing the healthcare industry be very impacted by caregiving. Um, Teledoc just, or Dr. On Demand, one of the telehealth companies said that the majority of their doctors that they bring on to do the telehealth work chose to go to Teledoc because it's flexible work that allow, flexible and virtual work that allows them to, to do their caregiving duties, but also maintain their, you know, their career and, and advance their profession. So, um, yeah, thank you for raising it. I'm going to do some work, but would love to partner with a, with an academic. Hey, Kurt, I'll send you, I'll send you the link on Doris Duke through Elliot, the Doris Duke foundation, and then some, a contact that if you're interested in that, I think, cause I, it's such important work and you're right. Nurses have such compassion fatigue. And then I don't know if I get a bonus question, but just the yeah, other bonus question. Thank you, Fish. And by the way, Elliot's my mentor, um, and I was blessed to find that. This idea of, you know, the other part of the sandwich is children and the idea of intergenerational care. And I've been involved with a few communities where having elderly involved with taking care of young children kind of meets two needs, but it's so invigorating uh, to seniors. Um, you know, showing things like decreased loneliness, delayed mental decline, reduced risk of disease and death in the elderly. Hey, do you guys look at, that's probably not your core business, Lindsay, but I'm just really interested in that construct of intergenerational care as a way to help faculty on both sides of the equation. I love that. I love that concept. And it's not something we're, we're focused on, but we should be. I love that. I'll bring that back to my team. I mean, what we are seeing is you know the traditional kind of care solutions um, aren't necessarily working for most families. You know, traditionally, you can either you put your kids in, you know, if they're young kids, they're in daycare, or you bring in a nanny if you can afford that. And what happened through COVID is suddenly daycares weren't safe or shutting down. Many of those daycares didn't reopen, so there's a massive shortage of in-center care options for, for families who want that. And then on the nanny side, many families didn't want nannies coming into their home. And so those nannies got other jobs. They needed to find work and are no longer nannies or, or in-home aides or CNAs. And so there's a massive shortage of, of care for kids coming into homes if you can afford that. Yeah. And so what we see is FFN is the solution, friends, family, neighbors. Um, families turn to friends, family, and neighbors. Now, the problem is, you know, how do you, you know, if there's benefit for older adults, but, you know, how do you pay family members? And, and what's interesting is many companies are happy to pay some sort of subsidy or or um, amount of money, a copay to cover some cost of care. Um, it gets a little complicated when you're trying to route that, route that subsidy to friends, family, or neighbor. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But I think there's a really interesting, one of the, one of the concepts I'm very fascinated by is you know, what we've seen in, in some other industries in this kind of sharing economy that we live in. You know, people share cars, people share dresses now through companies like Rent the Runway. You know, I'm, I'm intrigued by this concept of sharing care. You know, families can afford a nanny if they share in the cost of a nanny, um, but getting families together where they have the same care needs and can locate the right or share in the cost of a daycare and maybe, you know, maybe their complimentary schedules if somebody works different shifts and mm -hmm. they can use one, one slot. So I, I'm kind of fascinated by that notion. I don't see any companies doing that kind of sharing economy in a really cool way. Uh, there are some companies looking at how do you subsidize and help pay for friends, family, neighbors um, who are administering care. Um, but, but I love your concept, Norm, of creating more infrastructure for older adults to solve the older adult loneliness problem and solve the child care crisis. Um, so we'll work on that and I'll come back to you. Awesome. Thank you. Really great. Thank you for your work. Thanks, Norm. Good to hey, ho hope you're doing well, Norm. Let me just say that. Okay. <laughs> let me let me let me say I don't know if he'll answer me, but
But Chuck Clavitt, Clavitt, I pronounced his name wrong, is a big venture capitalist. I'm going to ask him if he thinks, what does he think about these business models? Chuck, are you there? Yeah, unfortunately, I came on uh, just oh. as Norman was talking. So I, I never heard the beginning part of the presentation. So I apologize. Okay, well, well I'll, I'll send you a replay. But that's good speaking to you also. So I will. But when did I, you start? At five or at five thirty? Five o'clock. Five o'clock. We always. Yeah. You spoke five o'clock. Yeah. I think Chuck was the. How bad it was. Chuck was our last speaker before we went on this hiatus for COVID. When he came, it was a Tuesday. We were banging elbows, and by the following week, you know, we were locked down like like everything else. But. Um, but I will ask, how are you funded? Yeah, we've raised capital. We have some. We have some kind of non-traditional um, funding sources. Um, one of our first and still our largest investor is a company called Hearst, uh, which is a private company. Most people think of Hearst as owning a bunch of media companies. Um, you know, they they still do. They own magazines and TV stations and newspapers, uh, but they also have a really large health holding. Uh, they own a bunch of healthcare companies, and so Hearst invested in us at our seed stage. Um, and we have big name um, individual investors. So uh, Jeff Weiner, who uh, was CEO for a long time of LinkedIn, now he's executive chairman, and Jonathan Bush, who started Athena Health, are both individual investors. Um, and then we've raised capital from uh, VCs, we have Polaris. Um, Polaris Partners, and um, as Elliot mentioned, our Series B was just led by Rethink Impact, uh, which is the largest growth stage um, fund that focuses on female founders solving big, big hairy problems. And so we're really excited to have Jenny Abramson, and her team involved, and we have Workday Ventures participated, wow. um, and some other smaller funds. Great. You know, real names. You know, what, you know, one thing, and I know Chuck knows this, this space real well, and you mentioned it also about things like Teladoc or one of those companies. It would seem like an ideal, as people go, you know, for healthcare, it's like it would seem to be a very strong way of uh, helping people out because you, you may be giving recommendations to people. And then how do you implement it? If, a, if all of a sudden you say, okay, the kid has, has a, some, you know, something where they need to stay home for two weeks, you know, the parents are kind of look at each other. Oh my, now people are home, maybe working, but normally what am I going to do for the next two weeks? And the fact that there would be some solution to a problem. Um, if, if, if we, you know, I mean, Chuck is involved in that space. I mean, was, does that make any sense, Chuck? Yeah, well, I would tell you most of what I am doing, it's called 98.6. It, it is telemedicine, but there are also um, apps or companies, uh, you know, I just trying to look up, I don't know if it's Bliss Health or it's uh, Nursing Solutions or Nursing, you know, there's all these various services like that that are in a, a you know, a private mode today and building, right? So there are, I, I'm not sure that's a direct relative of exactly what you're doing, but there are similar type companies. Okay, thank you. We're a little different, Chuck. So we're we're not telehealth. There, we have like a small competitive set, um, but right. telehealth companies are very complementary. Elliot, to your point, um, I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation. We've started to see this um, with Doctor on Demand and Grand Rounds, and we'll see more. You know, we're in talks with a couple of companies to combine forces um, because it's you know we don't. The whole goal is a better consumer experience where they don't have to go to one solution for this and another solution for this, you know, there's a one-stop shop and they get kind of all the support they need. Um, so more to come on that, but yeah, we're, we're a big fan of, of a number of the telehealth companies and certainly run into them in the poor space. You know, our clients all offer some form of telehealth or mental health. You know, there's a select group of us that are in every company. Um, okay. It's the Lyra Health and Wealthy and Hinge and, and Teladoc or Doctor on Demand, it's kind of this, this small crew of us. So, so let me ask you a question, you know, how do you, so this is um, a personal question perhaps, you mentioned you have four children. I know you have a, you had a new baby, it's probably within the last year. Yeah. I don't know, I thought that was your only one, but you have four children. How do you manage, you know, leading a company and having four children and doing everything that that requires in New York City? 
it's um it's it's hectic <laughs> our house is grand central i mean the other thing is i am one of these sandwich generation individuals my mother-in-law has parkinson's and dementia and um, she fell and broke her hip so now we're navigating kind of next steps she can no longer live independently with my father-in-law um and then you know my grandfather who's 98 years old he just developed cancer and just passed away recently but um i'm you know taking care of the kids that's logistics and hectic and you know figuring out homework and bedtime and this and that and then piled on to that you know the kind of getting up to connecticut and navigating through next steps with my mother-in-law with the rest of the family and i'll say listen i think you know what's very powerful is wealthy i mean i lean on wealthy we we found two nannies um, for our little toddler through Wealthy. We leverage Wealthy all day long for taking care of my mother-in-law. I don't think, I truly don't know where I would be as in my job, forget being CEO in any job, um, managing the care situation without having the, the partner in Wealthy. Um, so that's that's kind of my secret to doing it all. Um, and then it's And then it's really, you know, I'm very open about, you know, managing my time. I usually, except for tonight, I block on my calendar from five to seven every day. And I go and do dinner and bath time and uh, homework stuff with the kids and then get back online and I'll do more meetings, you know, seven to nine or 10. Um, but I have that dedicated time. That's family time. It's sacred for me. And except for you, Elliot, I don't, I don't do anything else. Okay, well, I, I appreciate you spending time with us. Let me let me let me reach out. Let me see. Amar, are you are you with Chris and uh, the surgical team at NYU? There, are you all together? Oh well, Chris is traveling right now. Okay, but, uh, but Amar, from a surgical perspective, I mean, you do you know involve with surgery? I mean, would this be helpful in patient discharge as having people with options? I mean, how often do people just kind of look at you after you tell them what they need to do, and they kind of look at you like, oh my God, how am I going to do that? Oh, absolutely. I think this is excellent. I enjoyed the talk a lot and what you're doing is, is incredible. And I think it it's very pertinent to our patients because uh, we deal with these cancer patients and we always struggle. I mean, right now we are partnering with a bunch of NGOs. Uh, there's the Nikki Mitchell Foundation. There's the Hope, Love, Faith. Uh, and, and they have these not so well established systems, but they are trying to support our patients through their efforts. But I think this is this is an excellent tool and it's very applicable. Uh, from, from a clinical standpoint, what I'd love to know is how we can integrate this tool and, and potentially look at metrics to demonstrate the cost effectiveness and feasibility of this. If we can demonstrate that we are in fact reducing readmissions if we uh if our patients are doing better with the support structure uh then i think that those data or those findings will help convince a majority of the clinical community to to adapt to this model well, thanks amar yeah i no I, I think everyone goes through the same challenges i think that's the thing and i, I think what you guys do uh lindsay i think uh you know, it's, it's impressive because you're providing solutions to what, what are, you know, truly difficult problems. So I know we're getting close to six o'clock. If anyone has a question, this is the time to raise your hand. Um, but if, if not, um, you know, Lindsay, I, I really do appreciate, I mean, it's amazing what you're doing and uh, I'll be wa we'll be watching from afar or, or up close because it's really, um, I mean, you have great, you know, you have great partners with Jenny and everybody else and all the stuff you're doing, but I, I think it's it's very impressive, um, male or female, being able to think of an issue that 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 personally touches you, and then be able to build on that, which is what you're doing. And I think it is you know it's uh, I know COVID has made it worse and all the things, but the reality is, and you know with with four and a half million people, mostly women, leaving the workforce because there's no way to do all of their other jobs. I, you know, you know, I, I could see why companies and you mentioned, it wasn't like you mentioned when you mentioned Accenture and other companies, Salesforce, you're mentioning the best of the best in terms of companies. And um, it'll be interesting to see how, as people look at benefits, I mean, it's hard, you know, you compete on salaries, but at the end of the day, everyone pays the same, you know, usually in the same industry, but how do you do those benefits? And a, this is a benefit, I think, 
if people know about it and know the value of it, I think it's going to really help people join and help people stay at companies. I agree with you. I, th I think care support is the next critical area of benefits. You know, it's, we, the, you know, health plan, you know, providing health insurance became, you know, just table stakes for companies to do 401k. And in some ways, those were social safety nets, right, to support employees, you know, health insurance was originally about supporting, you know, employees, if they, you know, for kind of more extreme situations, 401k plans to help employees, you know, plan for the, for their retirement or financial future. And I think care is starting to become the new third kind of category that companies are starting to realize that if they don't support employees with their care needs, they won't be able to retain employees. And to your point, Elliot, then it becomes an attraction thing too. You know, we, we now have a ton of tech clients, you know, with Facebook, Google and Salesforce and Cisco and HP and Oracle and Airbnb and Uber and all these companies, because they're like, well, I, if that guy's offering, if that company down the street is offering support for caregiving, we need to do that too. Um, and so we're starting to see a real movement with with supporting employees with care, which I think is really encouraging. Um, but I'm really, I, I'm really energized by this talk and it was so wonderful to spend time with you, Elliot, and meet, meet all the folks on the call and love your ideas, Norm and Mar, your comments and would love to partner. And we wanna, we wanna form closer partnerships uh, with the clinical side of, of care. It's not been an area we've been focused on, but I think you're right that there's a cost savings argument uh, reduce readmissions, all the things that we can um, tie together to to really support families in the way that they need it. Well, so, sounds great, and uh, we'll you know I wish you only the best, and we'll be watching closely. And anything you know, uh, I think from on behalf of everybody at Hopkins and everybody else who's on the call, we really want to thank you for spending time with us and uh, uh, really sharing you know a, a tremendous vision and what you're doing and how it's changing the world. And I think. Um, that's very exciting. So uh, it's it's you know I'm I'm, I'm watching you know <laughs> we'll have and I, and I still owe you dinner because uh, you know uh, we couldn't do anything here. So either I'll do it in New York or uh, I'll take you guys out or something to that effect. But uh, we really do appreciate it. And COVID will be over sooner than later. I hope so. I hope so too. And I can't wait for that dinner. That will be so fun. Thanks, Elliot. So well, Elliot, if you come to New York, I'm going too. All right, I'm counting you in. Okay, it's probably you know the you know a good restaurant. I don't know anything. I know Shake Shack. Right, I got right. a million great restaurants. Okay, all I know is Second Avenue Deli. Does that rate as a good restaurant? Uh, probably. I probably could get a, an amazing sandwich there. Is my guess. Yeah, yeah. you can. I th or you used to be able to. I don't know now. Oh, well, it's perfect, Elliot. It's one of the best sandwiches in New York, and it's right across the street from us. So whenever you're in town next, we should. I know. Go I was two blocks away yesterday. I was very tempted, but I didn't go. Yes. So. You go there, and then you go to your cardiologist. <laughs> right. That's true. Right. That's true. All right, guys. Well, thank everybody. We'll be back in two weeks, actually, um, with Trina Spear, who's the CEO, co-CEO of of, of Figs. And she's going to explain to us how in five years, she was here five years ago, and she was cashing in her 401k to support the company. And now the company is worth $6.5 And she's number 51 in the uh, Forbes rating of the women who, made, who have the most money in the United States who made it on their own. So it's a, it's a great story. And, um, you know, a, very similar to your story about, you know, looking at what people need and, um, you know, thinking about how people are. So it'll be a lot of fun. So um, thank you. Thanks again, Lindsay. And uh, thanks everybody for being here. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye-bye.